these are the top 10 films of 1949. When I say top, I mean my personal favourite films. Cheers. In a number 10, she wore a yellow ribbon. John Ford really went out of his comfort zone here, with this western starring John Wayne that was filmed in Monument Valley. Okay, this is very familiar territory. The second part of his cavalry trilogy features one of Wayne's best performances. After seeing him in Red River, Ford exclaimed, I didn't know the big son of a bitch could act. Here Wayne plays an older retiring veteran at a remote cavalry post, and his final mission is to prevent a new frontier war. The colour cinematography is great, and Wayne gives a suitably sombre performance, but the thing I love about this western is that it's anti-war, and has a surprisingly minor climax. A film about men capable of violence trying to prevent bloodshed. In a number 9, Jour de Fête, the marvellous Jacques Tati's directorial debut. This film is more charming than it is hilarious. Tati would go on to perfect the physical and visual gags with his Monsieur Hulot films, but this is really a love letter to the small town where he lived during the occupation in World War II. His film captures the pace of the town on summer days. He plays a negligent postman trying to deliver mail while a fair takes place in the town square. A common theme in his work is the changing world, and how the modern world is kind of soulless compared to the simpler times of the past. Here his love for the old ways comes across clearly. In a number 8, Bitter Rice, a truly bonkers Italian neo-realist film. It's simultaneously a crime film, a film about the struggles of the poor, and a kind of precursor to the woman in prison exploitation films of the 70s. The film is sexually charged throughout, with scenes of women fighting in mud, ripping each other's clothes off, and plenty of dancing. What sets this film apart is Giuseppe De Santis's direction. There are remarkable long shots, hundreds of extras, and he gives real life to this picture. The film takes place in a rice field where poor women from the cities travel to make money in the rice planting season. Doris Dowling plays a woman hiding out there, who is in possession of her criminal boyfriend's extremely valuable stolen necklace. Silvana Mangana plays a seductive woman who learns about this necklace. It's not a perfect film, but there's so much to admire here, making it a completely hypnotic mess. In a number seven, The Small Back Room. Powell and Pressburger made some of the most truly epic movies of the 1940s, but this lives up to its title and is anything but. Based on Nigel Balkin's novel, this film is about the heroes behind the scenes during World War II. The scientists back home, here working in a bomb disposal unit. Our protagonist is a scientist struggling with pain from his missing leg and a drinking problem. On top of all this, he is tasked with finding a way to disarm a new dangerous German bomb. The finale with him and the bomb on a beach is edge of your seat stuff, right up there with the disposal scenes in the Hurt Locker. The real joy here though is in the details of the backstage politics during the time, with politicians caring less about results and more about money and looking good. How times haven't changed. That's a Cambridge spot galvanometer. Oh, Cambridge, yes. In a number six, Stray Dog. Kurosawa was always ahead of his time. This procedural detective noir film is a precursor to the buddy cop movies. Kurosawa regulars Toshiro Mifune and Takeshi Shimura play two homicide detectives. Mifune has only recently been promoted to the division, and while riding on a crowded tram during a heat wave, he has his gun stolen. The rest of the film has him and his superior Shimura spend the rest of the day hunting the gun down. Kurosawa was inspired by Jules de Sand's The Naked City, and you can tell. The details into the search are fascinating, but also how he brings post-war Tokyo to life. In a number five, Thieves Highway. Speaking of Jules de Sand, here he directs a fascinating noir that revolves around apples. Richard Conte plays a World War II veteran who arrives home to find that his fruit farmer father has lost his legs in a murky situation in San Francisco. Conte teams up with a tough, no-nonsense truck driver and takes two trucks held together with duct tape filled to the brim with apples worth their weight in gold to the market. It's about desperate men and women, 
Valentina Cortese in particular stands out as a down-on-her-luck woman floating around the late-night fruit market. And as the central villain, Lee J. Cobb is fantastic as the unscrupulous fruit salesman. The film was shot on location at the market, and the details into that world are fascinating. Not all films need to be about bank robberies and drug deals gone wrong. Here it shows how even delicious apples can lead to excitement and danger. In a number four, Kind Hearts and Coronets, one of the great Ealing comedies. This dark comedy stars Alec Guinness, Dennis Price, Alec Guinness, Valerie Hobson, Alec Guinness, Alec Guinness, Alec Guinness, Alec Guinness, Alec Guinness, and in a standout performance, Alec Guinness. It's a comedy revenge film about a son who, after his mother's death, decides to get revenge on the upper-class family that disowned her after she married someone they considered beneath their station. Our protagonist goes on a humorous warpath, murdering the people ahead of them in the line to succession, all played by Alec Guinness. Of course, Guinness is having a ball as the family, and much like his other pitch-black Ealing comedy, The Lady Killers, when he goes over the top, it's a lot of fun. Also wonderful in it is Joan Greenwood, who gives her unique, lovable, raspy voice performance. Isn't who's talking? We ever heard of a gentleman blacking the lodger's boots? Ealing Studios made some fantastic films, and director Robert Hamer is an often non-sung-about hero of the studio. From a segment of the best Ealing horror, Dead of Night, to the kitchen sink precursor, It Always Rains on Sunday. But it will be kind hearts and coronets that he will be most remembered for. A wonderful British comedy. In a number three, White Heat. One of the most influential gangster films of all time. James Cagney had moved away from the crime films of the 30s, but his waning stardom made him return to the unhinged characters he had played in the previous decade. And what a return. His character, Jodie Jarrett, is an unstable, violent, charismatic master criminal. A heist expert with a short fuse. An FBI agent goes undercover with his gang to try and bring him down from the inside. You can see the influence of this film in cops and robbers films all the way up to now. Especially the mutual respect between the good guys and the bad guys. It's full of great set pieces, but of course it's Cagney that not only steals money, but also every scene he's in. He was such a charismatic actor. And even though he's playing a complete monster, it's hard to not love this psychotic mama's boy. In a number two, Late Spring, one of Ozu's very best films. This marks the first time Ozu would work with Setsuko Hara and is the first of his unofficial Noriko trilogy. In this, Early Summer and Tokyo Story, Hara plays a young single woman called Noriko struggling to get by in post-war Japan, although each character is a completely different person. This film centers on her relationship with her father, played by Ozu regular Shishu Ryu. He's a widower and she still lives with him. And at the age of 27, it seems like she is destined to not marry and remain looking after him. But when one day he states that he is going to remarry, she suddenly doesn't know where she belongs. It's a stunningly touching picture with two incredibly powerful central performances. It's about changing attitudes in Japan, about family, about duty, and about belonging. The revelation at the end is one of the all-time great film endings. Ozu was one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, and knew how to make a simple story riveting and heart-wrenching. And in a number one, The Third Man. This British noir is one of my favourite films of all time. Carol Reed was on one hell of a run in the 40s, following Odd Man Out and The Fallen Idol with this astonishing European set mystery. Set in post-war Vienna, we follow an American played by Joseph Cotton, who arrives in order to work with his friend Harry Lyme. But when he arrives, he finds out that Harry has died. He begins to look into what happened, and things get complicated when in one version of the tragic death, a mysterious third man seemed to help move the body. It's a wonderful story, masterfully written by the great Graham Greene. It has to be one of the best screenplays of all time. There are so many standout scenes and characters, and where so many movies are excellent up to a muddled ending, this one lands the ending in a perfect sombre fashion. The cast is exceptional. Joseph Cotton is perfect as the lost, slightly distant lead. Alida Valley is superb as Harry's former girlfriend. Trevor Howard and Bernard Lee are brilliant as military police. And for my money, Orson Welles has never been better as a shadowy figure at the center of the mystery. 
He's detestable yet charismatic. You hate him, but you can't help but worry for him. It's a masterclass performance. Look down there. Would you really feel any pity if one of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you twenty thousand pounds for every dot that stopped, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money, or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spend, free of income tax only, free of income tax? The film's cinematography is stunning. Shadows have never been better used, and the bombed-out streets of Vienna are a unique location. The film's cheery zither theme, played by Anton Karas, is one of cinema's great pieces of music. The juxtaposition of it with the dreary post-war city works a treat, along with the biting humour that is spread throughout the script. The third man is movie making at its best. Recently Danny Boyle stated that he thought that maybe the British weren't great filmmakers. And it's certainly true that our cinema is pretty up and down in terms of quality. But in the 1940s, with Carol Reed, Powell and Pressburger, Robert Hamer and David Lean working at wonderful UK studios, British filmmaking was some of the best in the world. Right, so counting down my top ten. In at number ten, she wore a yellow ribbon. In at number nine, Jour de Fete. In at number eight, Bitter Rice. In at number seven, The Small Back Room. In at number six, Stray Dog. In at number five, Thieves Highway. In at number four, Kind Hearts and Coronets. In at number three, White Heat. In at number two, Late Spring. And in at number one, The Third Man. Well, those are my top 10 films of 1949. There's probably loads I've missed out, so what are your top 10 films of 1949? Cheers.